Carlin, welcome to the show. You are a scholar, a small business owner, and the host of Beneath the Surface, a podcast that analyzes politics and society through an intersectional feminist lens. We have so many things to discuss today from anti-blackness and political organization to fat phobia and black superheroes. But before we dive into the meat and potatoes, I'd love to know your superhero origin stories. Uh, if we were reading the Carlin comic book series, um, mm-hmm. what happens in issue number one? You know, if, if Peter Parker gets bit by a radioactive Spider-Man, spider, uh, you know, what's sort of the defining Carlin moment uh, that can help us understand your superpowers? Ooh, that's a good, that's a really good question. It's funny because I also, I it's interesting that I never thought like, how to answer that question, um, even though I also host a superhero podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think, I feel like the thing that immediately comes to my mind is, um, I'm like, I grew up in a white suburb. That was like my origin story. Uh, or I feel like my superpowers would have come to me like later um, on in life because I um, there were all of these ways that growing up where I grew up, shout out to Glendora, California, um, that suppressed like my ability to feel empowered in the way that I think that I'm exercising my power as a person now. So I feel like my, like, I feel like the first issue, if I had to like pinpoint a moment of where I actually felt like I was truly stepping into myself, the first issue um, of my comic book origin story would start in like 2013 of me, like it'd be a panel of like me and my cousin and my cousin driving us to Tucson, Arizona, which is where I currently live. And is also where I started going to the University of Arizona Arizona, and that is where I really began to like unpack all of the different ways that I had learned to, um, to suppress myself internally. Hmm. And 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 how how would you say that um, turning of a leaf happened? Was it a moment like uh, that happened over time, or was it just like this one aha moment where you're like, you know what, fuck that, I need to change? Um, what was it like for you? It was so. It was, um, so I used to work for African American Student Affairs um, at the university. Mm -hmm. And at my university, we have um, multiple affinity spaces. So we have um, a space for African American students, Native American students, um, APIDA students, um, Latinx students, and then we also have a resource center for LGBTQ folks and um, for women, or women, women slash like gender variant folks. And so, I working in African American student affairs was a place where I was like submersed into being around um, Black people in a way that I hadn't been growing up in my hometown because again I grew up in like I grew up in like a super duper white suburb like my hometown is um, I looked at like because every now and then I look um, I have like nostalgic moments and I'll like be like I wonder what's going on. In <laughs> And so I Googled um, the, like, the racial demographic. And so the racial demographic of my hometown has shifted slightly, but white people still outnumber all of the BIPOC people. It's like three to one or something. Whoa. So, Whoa. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so it really was me coming to... Um, coming to Tucson and being in this space and being in relationship with Black people and having like a Black mentor um, and having like an extended Black community that was outside of my family that allowed for me to like explore and unpack and, um, and like acknowledge like parts of myself that I hadn't been able to because I grew up in, I grew up in a white town. Um, A lot of my friends were either white or non-black people of color. And then when I was, um, I even went to, I ended up going to community college in my hometown also. Um, Shout out to Citrus College. Um, And so I I, um, ended up being in student government. And so I was still primarily occupying like spaces where I was either the singular black person or it was like me and like three other black people. So I was, I was occupying all these spaces where there weren't a whole bunch of black people. And I was like, okay, 
there's there's a particular you know there are particular narratives that people have about black people and i don't want for people in this space to think those things about me so it led to all of these like it led to all of these behaviors of me being like well i can't do this thing because if i do people are going to think this about me and i can't have that happen because i'm the literally only fucking black person in this space <laughs> But then when that changed and there were other Black people, I was allowed to be messy and I was allowed um, to explore like my identity as a queer person. And I was allowed to um, think about Blackness in a much more like nuanced way because there were other people that were like, yes, it's okay for Black people to be multifaceted and multidimensional. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I love what you are talking about when it comes to just this idea of, you know, when you were the only um, BIPOC person in... A predominantly white space there's this feeling of like okay well if i'm one out of one or one out of three like i have to look a certain way because i don't want them to perceive my whole community through the lens of how i'm acting and now i'm just this stereotype whereas when you're in the company of other folks who are who are from your community there's more nuance and you can feel like oh, okay well i don't have to just be this person i can i can you know, be all these different parts of my identity. Um, and, and sort of speaking on that, um, I want to go ahead and talk about uh, anti-blackness, which is uh, a subject that uh, you discuss in your anti-blackness and you workshop uh, available yeah. through your business, uh, the High Priestess Consulting Company. Uh, I'm sure that over the last 10 years, you've met a, a wide range of people from uh, varying forms and levels of severity of anti-blackness. And some people, I'm sure, were very enlightened by the workshops and, you know, they were able to learn really easily. But I'm also curious about the ones who weren't as easy to teach. Uh, you know, the people who you've taken to these workshops and, you know, they kind of struggled with these concepts of anti-blackness. Um, so looking over the history of the people that you've talked to during these workshops and just yeah. overall in your in your career, um, what can you say about the people who have succeeded during these workshops and why? And then what about the ones who perpetually fail and just continue to not get it? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, I feel like it's, um, I think it's a combination of things, right? So I think there's like varying levels of people who get it and people who don't get it. So I think the first, like the first obstacle is that if you're like not a black person, there are particular ways that no matter how well I explain it or how I articulate it, like folks just want to understand because you have to experience it, right? So like that, so that was, that's like the first piece of, I think even just understanding anti-blackness in general, right? Is that for non-black people, um, there are ways that you will never understand it because you don't experience anti-blackness. And like, that's just, like, that's just the truth of the matter, right? Like that is like, that is part of the truth of living under white supremacy is that um, for some of our identities, the way that we understand them is because of how we are experiencing certain things. So I think that for the folks, the folks who are able to get it as much as they can, they are willing to lean into that discomfort of like, of understanding that there is only so much of a way that they will be able to get it. And they're also not fixated on like, um, cause there, so there's a particular way that, that I have noticed that happens sometimes in um, DEI spaces, so diversity um, and inclusion, um, di diversity and inclusive excellence um, spaces, that are diversity, equity, inclusion um, spaces where folks, their fixation is on embodying experiences outside of their own. And like, that's not, that's like not what, that's like not what being empathetic is. Like, you don't need to know what it feels like to be a black person to mm -hmm. like, to want to dismantle anti-blackness. So for the people who get it, they're not fixated on, I want to feel what it feels like to be oppressed. I'm like, no, that's not the <laughs> point. Um, <laughs> that is not what we're asking for. Um, the folks who get it are like, I want to, I want to understand 
how the way that I am viewing the world is limiting my ability to see how I'm upholding this harmful system. What behaviors am I participating in? What beliefs have I internalized um, that I am then acting on either consciously or subconsciously that is upholding this violence that is harming you, like as the person facilitating this as a black person and also like black people collectively, right? So those are the folks who are like successful in receiving the information. Um, the cha- the larger challenge is though, and it's all it's really funny too because I was literally having a conversation um, with two black femmes yesterday. We were talking about this. Is the difficulty with anti blackness in general is that there are so many things that in order for people to actually divest from it, they would also have to divest from these behaviors, these systems, these beliefs, these things that like in a, in many ways that benefit them, which I go over in the workshop too. That a lot of people just aren't willing to do right, like. Why would you want to divest from colorism, for example, if colorism, like, props you up? Um, (laughs) Why would you want to let go of that? Why would you want to give that away? So I think that that's um, what has been challenging just in general for toppling, uh, I think, like, racism and anti-Blackness is people not wanting to give up the things that give them power under anti-Blackness. The other thing that's also kicking our ass is a lot of people conflate anti-Blackness and racism as the same thing. So sometimes people will be describing something that is anti-Black and then they will use the word racism. And I'm just like, no, that's not racism. That's happening to you. That's anti-Blackness. And they use them interchangeably and they're not interchangeable. So one of the things that I say in my workshop is that um, racism and anti-Blackness are like identical twins. And the only way that you can tell them apart from each other is if you familiarize yourself with them. And so I use that analogy because I actually grew up with people. There's, um, there were two girls in my friend group who were twins. They were identical twins and because I knew them and I was friends with them and I spent a lot of time with them it was easy for myself and for my friends we could tell them apart like we because we knew them we were like we were intimate with them they were our friends we hang up we hung up with them often but other people who were just meeting them they were like I don't know how to tell the difference between the two of you and we always were just like how can you not tell the difference between the two of them they look completely different from one another but that's because we were familiar with them wow that twin analogy i think is brilliant because that really does capture um, the the essence of, of sort of that difference because, you know, when it comes to differentiating between anti-blackness and racism, um, it's like there are similarities and there are differences. And because it doesn't, you know, anti-blackness isn't a physical thing. It's just, it's not like a one thing. It's so mm-hmm. hard for people to really wrap their heads around like, well, what does this look like? Like how yeah. does, how does anti-blackness look like in terms of behavior or like systems or shows or, or, or whatever. Um, but you illustrating this sort of twin analogy is really great because um, like, you know, kind of like when you actually do meet twins, like you have to look at them like, oh, your eyes actually just a little bit different than the other person. So mm-hmm. you have to do have that familiarity with, Um, actually engaging in these conversations um, and you can't just diagnose it without really having a a more deep uh, understanding. Yes. Uh, Now, another passion of yours is uh, political organization. Uh, For over a decade, you've facilitated workshops. uh, You've been in leadership positions where you help people uh, to think more critically about race, about gender, about sexual orientation and power dynamics. Um, I greatly appreciate the work uh, that you do because you help to crack people's minds open so they can, you know, walk out of the workshop or out of the office um, in the classroom and step into the world uh, with a more fresh and open perspective to um, more progressive issues or just being generally more empathetic. Uh, But given the political climate that we're in right now, you know, sometimes opening people's minds to new ideas can be a lot harder than it seems, you know, and in our era of, uh, of, of fake news, it's hard to organize people's, uh, uh, to organize people, uh, when so many folks can pick and choose 
the science or the history or the research facts that they find most convenient. And so my question to you is, you know, in this age of fake news and, and, and massive uh, uh, political disinformation, how do you feel about our current landscape of political organization in America? Um, and how do you think everyday folks like me or you or the people who are uh, listening to our conversation right now, how do you think they can make um, decisions to participate um, in this meaningful progress? Like how can they, uh, you know, uh, 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 be involved? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. I think about that a lot, actually. Um, so it's like, I feel like the answer to this is a, it's an and also. So part of it is, I don't know. Um, just, and like the, I don't know part of it is, I don't know because it's just, it's so big, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the, the disinformation, the disenfranchisement, the, like the various ways that people, like the way that our society is structured so that certain people can't even access information um, is like, it feels overwhelming, right? So I mm -hmm. think about, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna bring in like an example. So I used to work for the Red Cross like a hundred years ago. It wasn't a hundred years ago, but it feels like it was that long, it was that long ago. <laughs> And that job was, besides being soul crushing, because I worked in the call center, so like I did not enjoy the work, so that's why it was soul crushing for me. Some of the people who work who worked at the who work in the call center, they love it. I was not one of those people. But one of the things that became evident to me while working at the Red Cross was the way that my life was currently was structured at that time. Um, I had to take the bus to get to work. Um, so it took me, and it took me forever to get to work. So it was like, I think like an hour and a half or two hour bus ride just to get to like the other side of town. Because the transportation in, in Tucson is, is questionable at best. And so it took forever for me to get to work. And it was like, and then I also had to do that like home, right? So um, on days that like a friend couldn't give me a ride home or my cousin and I had actually had worked at the same place or he couldn't give me a ride home, I had to also take the long bus ride home. So I was leaving my house at like, and then we worked like nine, like the way that our um, days were structured was like four of our days, I think were like nine hour days. And then on Saturdays we worked like a half day. And so I had, so I was spending nine hours like actually doing work and then spending four hours getting, or three to four hours getting to and from work. So I was like, there is no time for me to like, oh, I mean, like I would try to use my, my like riding on the bus. So I did actually read Bell Hooks' All About Love while I, when I rode the bus to work. But like the longer I was working for the Red Cross, the less energy I had to like read a bell hooks book because i was so drained from like the, the mundane routine that had become my life that i was like when i was not at work i wanted to do things to decompress from work i wanted to i wanted to exercise my ability to choose to do whatever i wanted to do but because so much of my life was being dictated by work and so i was like hmm I'm only, I was like, I do not plan on staying at the Red Cross forever. Like it was, I was working there because it was a means to an end. I was trying to get back into school. I needed, I needed to do some kind, I needed work um, to sustain myself while I wasn't in school. Um, so I was like, let me just work. Or my cousin actually was like, bitch, you need a job. Like just work here <laughs> for now. Um, and so that's what I did. And but like I'm I'm glad that I was able to do that because that experience also helped shape my analysis of understanding that when we are thinking about organizing and, and giving people information, we have to be creative about the ways that we are giving people information. We have to be intentional about who are we targeting when we are mobilizing people. Are we thinking about people who work in call centers, right? And are we thinking about folks whose whose job 
structures are so rigid and so like that they're almost ritualistic where there isn't a whole bunch of free time for them to do the other things that they have to do to also sustain themselves as people and also we're trying to activate them right like to be politically active in these things and i don't think that as organizations and i've worked for a lot of different organizations we're not very we're not good at that right we are not because most of the people who work in um so most people who work in particularly structured organizations. So many of the organizations that I have worked for um, politically have been like large, have either been large organizations, like I used to work for Next Gen. They were backed by Tom Steyer. Tom Steyer's a fucking billionaire, right? Mm -hmm. So they had a shit ton of money. So like, so that was like one of the organizations that I worked for that was like well-resourced. I also um, was worked for the Arizona Students Association, which like currently doesn't have as much money as they used to as like they did back in the day, but they are still connected to other organizations that are well-resourced, right? So there's like a particular group of people who are accessing this space to be able to work there. We come from, we either have class status or we are like hovering class status. Usually it's folks who, you know, who are either in school um, or who have proximity to like universities, right? And those are not, those are the groups that are well resourced that can that have the reach and are often on the and that are sometimes influencing what is happening on the ground right whereas there are definitely grassroots organizations that are like we are trying to organize the people who are actual like working class people and we're trying to get to those folks and we're trying to mobilize them but they don't have those are not the groups that are being resourced though right so i think that that's like part of the disconnect is the way that even folks who are doing this work are organized is inequitable also. Mm. And and you mentioned, um, you know, the, the key word creativity as sort of the solution, um, which I really like because um, I actually had, um, uh, when I was invited to Binghamton University to do a TED talk, um, I, I did my talk on um, social media activism and how I believe that oftentimes we tend to downplay social media as like, oh, okay, well, it's just people on the internet. But the reality is that there are a lot of people who, like you said, because of work, because of a number of things, it could be disability, it could be, you know, an anxiety of being out in public spaces. Um, there is this tendency to look at activism or or people, you know, trying to, to organize to, to create change as if it's this thing that only has to be done in person, you know, mm -hmm. on a picket line. But there, like you said, it's it's about creativity. It's a, it's about mobilizing different people where they are, meeting them um, where they are. Um, when you look at the uh, organizations that you've worked for and you've seen the inefficiencies and how like okay, well they're not really good at reaching out to this group of people or to that group of people, and you've probably seen who gets you know highlighted within the system and who gets to be the face of this movement and then who also should be a uh, a member of this conversation but because of their situation they just can't um so in your perspective like what's sort of the the way forward like how are some ways that we can engage some of these people who you know that they want to be involved and you know you know that they are uh impacted by the so the social issues uh that you are fighting for but how you know how do, how do you reach out to the person who is you know working a, a graveyard shift and they're sleeping all all throughout the day you know how, how do you reach out to the person who is a stay-at-home mother who can't leave because you have a child who has special needs and they need to be taken care of all the time like how do you go about that um, I think that we have to actually care about those people. And most of the time we don't like that's like real talk, right? Um, I think that that and and this is right this is for the groups that i have worked for and a lot of the groups that i have worked for have specifically focused um on students um so there's that piece right is that a lot of the groups that i have worked for have either focused on students slash young people but like i also am learning that young people seem to also translate to students <laughs> <laughs> like they like people use the use the word youth but they also they often mean 
just students um, because I think that folks think, I think that people think that universities and college campuses are easy places to target folks, which like, kind of right uh, or not even kind of yes but i think that one of the things that um that fucks people up in their organizing is we have a very um simplified understanding of what a student is which is also like now that i'm saying this out loud which is also very interesting because like i'm a student but i'm like i'm a super non-traditional student right like i still don't have my bachelor's degree and i have been pursuing a bachelor's degree for almost a decade right so like i am like the perfect example of the person that these organizations really don't like they would not know how to organize me right like they would not know how to mobilize me because i don't fit neatly into any of the things that people think about students but all of the different people that you just listed those people are also students there are people who are mothers mm -hmm. who are students there are people who work graveyard who are students right like there's all kinds of different students um there's all different kinds of young people also and i don't know that we when we are organizing, we don't have expansive enough. Uh, one of the other pieces is also like a lot of folks who are doing this mobilizing work, they have, they don't like their analysis isn't always that great. <laughs> um, and like that is, that's like harming us, right? Is that there is this, there is this idea that you being like an organizer or calling yourself an activist like that that's the end of the beginning of it like there isn't this understanding that being an organizer and being an activist also means there needs to be a commitment to you as an individual and then also to organizations to constant reflection to constant learning to constant um re like listening to people for feedback, to looking to see are the things that you're doing effective, to looking to see are the things that you're doing the things that people even want. And there is like a refusal in some of the organizations, at least that I have been a part of, to actually do that work of saying, what we're doing isn't working. We need to, we actually need to do something else. Or, or the tactic that we're using isn't working. We need to try a different approach there is like this there is a hesitancy to do that from the folks who are driving the directives right um because i have always when i have worked in all the organizations that i have worked for i've always been like a person who has actually been on the ground i've never been like a middle management person i've never been um a higher up person, right? And so, but I have interacted with people who have been like regional directors and things like that. And hearing that the disconnect between the people who are like, we are the executives or we're HR or we're whatever the fuck, and we are driving the metrics or we're giving the directives or, you know, the state director is, you know, they're telling, from they're like HR or HQ is telling me this thing. And then the people on the ground are like, who cares? That's not, that's, that's not going to be effective here in this place, in this, in this town, on this campus where you're telling me to do those things, that's not going to work here. Right. So there's also this lack of autonomy that is happening because people want people want for movement to look the same everywhere. And that's just not what, that's just not what happens. Even here where I live in Arizona. So again, I live in Tucson. Organizing in Tucson is very different than organizing in Phoenix, which is very different than organizing in Flagstaff. And we have to be able to accept that it's going to take different tactics to organize people in different spaces because people are having different experiences, even in the same state. Yeah, and I love that attention to nuance because that really is the key. You know, it's it's realizing that you can't have just this, um, the same solution that you think will work in New York uh, will apply to California because it's completely different. Uh, mm -hmm. And and continue on the, continuing on this discussion of politics, um, a big part of politics is language and communication. Um, mm -hmm. You know how we talk about social issues, different yeah. communities, um, and the words that we use to describe them can have just as much if not more of an impact than the actual ideas themselves. And one phrase that keeps popping up in the news, um, especially especially from right-wing news media, is this fear-mongering over the term critical race 
theory. Now, oh, I'm that you're asking about <laughs> now they, you know, <laughs> we're 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 at this point now where it's like, you know, like we understand the 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 complexity of critical race theory, but now they're just calling it CRT for shorthand, and mm-hmm. and it, it just feels so dismissive because again, there's just so many social issues that are wrapped into critical race theory. Um, yeah. But as somebody who uh, does rhetorical and political analysis. You know, you're you're able to look at the politics, and you're also able to look at the words that are constructing these political discussions. Um, what's your read on what's happening right now with the term critical race theory? Like, because a lot's happening nationwide on yeah. so many different fronts. Whether you're, whether you're talking about education, whether you're talking about uh, politics, like, what's your assessment? Um. It's a mess, right? Um, and so, so I live, so I'm not from Arizona. I'm from California. So I grew up, right, my white suburb mm-hmm. that I grew up in is outside of Los Angeles. Um, so I grew up in Southern California. And I did. I moved to Arizona in my, I was 25, I think, 24, 25, something like that, somewhere around that age. And... The landscape here is totally different, right? Like California and Arizona are like different countries, it feels like, because the culture is just so different. And so I live currently in a state where they, the superintendent of the state banned ethnic studies at the high school level, right? So like, because we, so there is a school here where folks in the community, they organize and one of the high schools actually, like they actually were able to get ethnic studies to be taught in high school. Like they made it like, I think it was like elective courses that folks were able to take because a lot of the students were like, we keep on learning about white people and all the things that white people are doing, but we're not learning about like what, you know, black folks, Latinx people um, are doing. So there's a lot. So, so they were, so they, you know, people in the community organized, they got that to change. And it was, and they saw that there was a change, like in, it was a positive for the students of color, right? Is Mm -hmm. that these young students of color were like they, their their grades improved, like their writing improved because there was just another way to engage them as students where they felt exciting and where they were seeing people who looked like them being empowered, right? So I live in a state where like they banned that shit. And like they banned it, like they have the ban happened like recently. And, and I want to say in the last like I think in the last like 10 years that happened. I think it actually may have, I think the ban may have happened in 2013 or 2014. So like when I had first gotten here and I wasn't like plugged into organizing. So I didn't know like all of the tea about everything. And so I'm not, it is not shocking to me that the right would create this new moral panic around critical race theory because I live in a state where they literally did something like they did something similar on a smaller scale using similar like rhetoric, right? They were like this, the things that they're being taught are divisive. They're the things that they're being taught is un-American. They're being taught to hate America. And I'm just like, no, they're not. They're being taught to think critically about what the United States has presented itself as and then what that reality has been and who has that been real for. for. And so I want to bring into this converse, I think that, so I want to bring two other things into this conversation because I feel like they're relevant, right? So one of them is I was on Twitter, um, which I love being on, by the way, like Twitter (laughs) is, Twitter is like this amazing and terrifying place. It is, it is both like, so it is both, it, it brings me so much joy. And also there's a lot of horrific things that exist on Twitter simultaneously. Um, and I experience both of them daily. And so, So do you remember there is, I can't think of her name and I feel really shitty for not remembering her name, but the journalist who was supposed to get hired at 
um, I think it's UNC, Chapel Hill. And then they were just like, ooh, JK Lowell, we don't want to hire you anymore because like the board, the board of trustees was like, yes, you went through the tenure process and we were going to hire you for our department. But they were like, JK Lowell, we don't want to hire anymore because you being here feels political because she's the one who authored the 1619 project. Mm, okay. I think I, I don't remember, remember her, but I feel really bad for not remembering who she is. Um, because I also follow her on Twitter, so this makes it even worse. Um, so she posted, so I follow so I'm following her. She retweeted something about the 1619 project, and so I'm reading the tweets and reading the conversation because um this is this I feel like this is actually a really important piece of how I create my analysis is I'm literally looking at like what are people saying like what are what are the patterns of behavior that folks are, are participating in what are the talking pieces that folks are using what am I seeing people repeating over and over and over again to know all oh, these folks don't actually know what the fuck they're talking about they're literally parroting phrases that they have heard from somewhere else so I get to a thread in the multiple threads that now have that now exist in like this in this tweet and there was this white man who who said it he said it so plainly and it's and the like the thing that the things that he said in his tweet are so chilling to me because this is how insidious white supremacy is and he, and this man he knows it and i like it 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 like I will think back on this interaction and it chills me because I'm just like, these fucking people literally know what they're doing and they just do not care. So this man, he's like, he was he's, he identified as like a libertarian. And he was like, yeah, I don't think he was like, I don't disagree necessarily with the project. He was like, I also don't necessarily disagree with CRT. He's like, I just think that we shouldn't teach young people that the United States is bad. He's all because then they won't want to defend it. And he's like, we need for people to love this country so they will die for it. And he was like, and we can't do that if people know that this country is actually a piece of shit and we're teaching them that when they're like children. He was like, we can teach them. He was like, we can teach them that the United States is this shit when they go to school. And so I was just like, <laughs> so I responded because I was like, bruh, I was like, as someone who works in education and does fucking diversity and inclusion work and like literally is committed to trying to teach people how to think critically about the United States, what you are saying is so much more difficult than how you are laying it out. I was like, people literally come to school, they come to college and have spent their entire childhoods being indoctrinated, being told that the United States is this and this is what the history is and race, everybody can participate in racism and all of this other shit. And I was like, and they are literally cause psychological distress when people tell them that these things that they have been told their entire lives are not true. And I said, and one of two things happens, either they double down on their bullshit because they're like, I have been told for my entire life that the United States is the best country in the world, that there is freedom, that we are just and equitable and meritocracy is real. I said, so they either double down on the shit that they have been taught their whole lives because it's easier to do that than to open up their minds to learning and then having to reconcile everything that they have been told their entire lives being a lie. I was like, so you are literally saying that you're okay with people being lied to because you want for them to defend the country instead of them actually, one, being able to think about the things that this country is currently doing and has done in the past and actually have the tools to be able to make the country be the country that they want for it to be. And he was like, yes. <laughs> and I was like, and I was just like, Oh my God. Yeah. It's like, it, it's, it's so frustrating when you have those situations because it's like, 
you know, there's all, and I hate that I, it's not that I like hold out and, and hope for, you know, the, the few white people who get it. And I'm like, yay. Like I'm like banking on them to save us. But, you know, th there is always this feeling like, okay, well, at least there are some white folks who, who get it. And yet, you know, you're you're bringing up because the the reality is this dude is not the only one who feels this way. You know, there's just so many white people who identify as, oh, well, I'm a Democrat or I'm progressive. I care about these issues, blah, 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 blah. But when you really hold their feet to the fire and you ask like, OK, but then do you think we should stop? you know imperializing other countries do you think that we should you know uh, uh, uh stop celebrating confederate history um so many of them just because they have also been indoctrinated by our same education system but because they are white and like you were saying before um you know when you're when you're talking about the dis distinction um of the people who get it during the workshops and those who don't and the ones who don't get it are the ones who like they see oh shit like this is actually a, like this white privilege shit is actually good for me and i actually don't want to distance that. myself from that yes. and yeah and and like you said like um your your word choice is perfect it's chilling it's chilling because it's like wow you know what like you're the person who is already difficult to find like someone who who can just recognize and just at least acknowledge that this thing is real that's critical race theory is important yes. but you you still you just are, don't give a fuck you yeah. literally don't care because you don't because it benefits you and like the fact that this man said this on the internet where everyone can see it and i screenshotted that shit too because i was like i don't i was like i need to keep this for my record so that i can like when i share this story i don't want to like miss interpret what he said because he was just like yes because people will not defend this country if they know how horrible it actually is and i was like and you're just and he's like okay with that right and there has to be other people who share his sentiment which like which is the other piece that i want to bring into this conversation so today is 9 11 right mm -hmm. and it has been 20 years since 9 11 happened and it's interesting being like so i'm i'm like how old am i i'm 33 um, i had to think for a second i was <laughs> like how old am i um so i'm 33 i'm gonna be 34 at the end of the year and so i was 13 when 9 11 happened so i was in seventh grade and remembering so it's, it's always really weird being a person who does like political work and like I majored in political science um, and I also am a gender and women studies major too and like being a person of my particular like you know who was growing up in the 2000s right and talking like interacting with people who are older than me right who are like whole ass adults who have lived through like multiple presidential administrations and have like lived through like multiple historic events like seeing that like there's also this weird disconnect about like how we remember things and I and I think a piece of that is because like I have grown up in like my generation of people we have grown up like with the internet so like there are all of these different ways that we can actually like we're we have much more power to document how we remember things opposed to it being propagated to us and like being told like or the word there are there are whole, there aren't a whole bunch of things like trying to help i mean there are a lot of things that try to help us misremember things but we have other tools that are like actually no this is what happened and so being in this moment where it's 20 years later, what happened in Afghanistan happened like two or three weeks ago. And remembering that there were people who were like, we should not be doing, we should not be going to war. We should not, what we're doing is nonsensical. And like for decades, people were like, this war is bad. This war should not have ever happened. This war should still not be happening. We continue as the United States to destabilize regions of the world and we're doing it again. And for like 
for that to be part of the analysis that happened. And then this weird, like, there's also this disconnect that I have where, like, a lot of folks, well, not even a lot of folks, white people and people who, and, like, BIPOC people who are ambassadors to white supremacy have this, like, page, they have these feelings of patriotism to the United States because of 9-11. Whereas, like, I feel like as, like, a young Black person who was growing up in a white suburb, 9-11, all it did for me was it just confirmed all of the ways that I had been taught that the, the America that I live in is very different than the America that other people occupy. 9-11 just, like, made that just more apparent to me. Um, so I remember... The, I remember immediately how the rhetoric around certain things drastically changed, right? So like mm -hmm. immigration, for example, it was sort of like, like I grew up with like knowing, my mom like worked with undocumented people. I like knew, I would like, my mom was a single parent. And so I would like go to work with her a lot. So like I knew, you know, a lot of her coworkers and like I was like being undocumented, like it's just a thing, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't something that was like bad. It was just something that was, I mm -hmm. obviously didn't understand like the complexities of it. I just knew, like, I was like, these people don't have papers. I don't really know why they don't have papers, but I also know. But then when, like, the news cycle started after 9-11 happened and they were targeting immigration as a way to be like, we need to be afraid of immigration. Mm -hmm. and we need to our border because terrorists are going to use the borders to stick it to our country and take America. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I was like, what fucking people are y'all talking to? Because... From like from my lived experience, I was like, I don't know what undocumented people you all are talking about or who you know, but I was like, those are not the people that I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know, I don't know who the fuck y'all talking to, right? And that, and I and like that, and I keep going back to how it was so important for me to have had relationships with other people because I had like, I had lived counter narratives to the things that like the news was telling me, right? Like, and there was another, I had a, um, I had a neighbor, or there was someone who lived like near me. We weren't like next door neighbors, but we lived like in the same neighborhood and we had gone to school together. And so him and his family, they were Indian. And I remember being, I remember being afraid for my classmate because I was just like, oh my gosh, like people are, mind you again, seventh grade, right? And I remember being terrified and I was just like, oh my gosh, I don't want like this, this kid who I had, we had like just been in school with each other for like forever. We weren't like close friends or anything, but I just remember being scared for him and his family because I was like, he looks like because he's a dark skinned mm -hmm. Indian person, him and his family look like the people that the news is framing as terrorists. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are going outside beating people to death because they look like these people that this country has deemed dangerous. And now they're, and like people are dying. And I'm like, that could be my classmate again, seventh grade, right? So there was, so 9-11 to me, and there's all the other shit, right? Like how the Patriot Act passed and what happened with airports and like heightened security and how it, it um, how 9-11 also um, led to all of these like laws that racial, like that allowed for like racial profiling. So here in um, Arizona, SB 1070, which was basically the, if you look, if you look like an illegal, if you look like an illegal alien, we're gonna pull you over. And I'm like, what the fuck does that even mean, right? But then, but emphasis on look, right? Who are the people that they are looking for? Who are the people that have been deemed dangerous? And how has that shaped how we are able to be in relationship with one another? And how has that solidified um, white supremacy? So to bring this back to CRT, I think that people are scared of critical race theory because they recognize that critical race theory gives us the literal language to be able to name all of the things that I just named. Here's how the United States turned an, a terrorist attack 
inward and allowed for that act of 9-11 to re to reassert white supremacy internally as a country and it said we need to be able to richly profile people in order to keep us safe but who are we keeping safe if i am an american person as a black person but i'm not allowed to be seen as american because of my blackness how is that keeping me safe it's not <laughs> but it's keeping white people safe but it's not keeping me safe it's not keep it didn't it wasn't keeping my classmate who I was like, please no one murder him because he's Indian, like and not a fucking terrorist, right? It wasn't keeping him safe. So yeah, that is one of the things that had that like I've been thinking about is I'm like 9-11 just really highlighted how um how we do live in two different Americas and how how the United States has constantly used world events to reassert and to repivot white supremacy. And you had mentioned um, a really um, important term, which is counter narrative. Um, and that sort of goes into this next topic that I actually wanted to explore, um, which is actually fat phobia. Uh, and this is a subject that you cover in your uh, no fats, no femmes, no blacks, when, pre when preferences are just prejudice uh, workshop. And yeah. for a lot of folks, you know, fat phobia doesn't show up on their sort of activist radar, because so many of us have been conditioned to believe that the um, emergence of the body positivity movement is what solved fat phobia and sort of the same similar way that um you know the uh election of president obama you know cured racism or the way that you know Hil <laughs> the way the way the way that hillary would have you know defeated sexism um yeah. you know i i find this topic really fascinating because the body positivity movement is still going very strong, uh, but you actually have mentioned that in many ways, uh, it actually made things worse. Uh, so what exactly is everyone missing about the body positivity movement? Yes, so I actually have an episode, the, the last episode that I released of my podcast, um, Body Positivity and Fat Phobia, I talk about this very thing, right? And so shout out to Maintenance Phase, which is another podcast um, hosted by, uh, what are, I'm like, Michael Hobbs and Aubrey, I can't remember her last thing off the top of my head, um, but it's, it's so good. So they do a whole bunch of analysis around um, diet culture and like diet fabs or diet fads. And so they do, so that like, so then in addition to like a whole bunch of other people, so like I've been listening and following um, Deshaun Harrison, who is also a fat activist and recently released a book, um, Belly of the Beast. Um, so like they have helped me. And in addition to like me kind of, so, I haven't always been a fat person, but I've never, well, actually, no, that's not true. Or actually, yes, that is true. So I, I haven't always been a fat person in the sense of like fat in my actual ability to navigate the world has been difficult, but like I was fat in the sense of my body was still not socially acceptable, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, right? And those are two, those are not the same thing. And this is one of that. So that's one of the reasons why I think fat phobia is hard to combat because there's a difference between feeling like a fat person and being a fat person. A lot of people feel like fat people because they have, we have this really fucked up and morphed and like totally distorted view of like what our bodies are supposed to be because there's an industry that makes a lot of money off of that, right? And keeping us in these constant cycles of like self-loathing loathing and self-hatred and self-hatred that we feel like if we exhibit things that we have been told that are associated with fatness, that we are thin fat, right? And I'm like, that's not true. There are a lot of thin people whose asses I want to be constantly because I'm just like, you having body dysmorphia is valid but you are not fat, you feel fat, that's not the same thing and I will fight you. 
God, I will literally throw down with you because you feeling fat and then still being able to do all of the things that are that are allowed for thin people, which I talk about like golden clothes shopping, being being desirable, not being told all the time that you should die and hate yourself because having a fat body and existing and minding your business feels people feel like they can harass you about, right? You're not experiencing those things. You're not experiencing those but that violence. You just feel fat because you have been told that your body doesn't meet some kind of standard. Wow. I actually am fat and actually have to navigate the world as a fat person. I have to navigate the world as like, what types of activities will I not be able to partake in because it has been designed in such a way that I am not, where I have been deemed not able or I should not be able to do those things, right? Um, that is like embodiment of fatness is where there are literally things that I cannot do, not because I don't want to, but because when people were creating those things, they did not have people like me in mind when they did, when they were designing those things. Right. So that's like the other piece of it is that like fat phobia, similarly to like all of the other isms and phobias, there are, there's a particular way that our society has been structured that literally excludes fat people from being able to partake in those things because we're like, those fat people shouldn't exist. Therefore, they will not exist in this space. So speaking of, you know, this notion of existing and existing in uh, different spaces, uh, I actually wanted to do a, a quick little costume change and switch over to the uh, nerd world so we can talk about superheroes and representation. And this is a yes. topic that you and I actually both love talking about. Um, you yes. love comics and representation so much that, again, you had mentioned that you uh, host a podcast called Comic Book Queens with your co-host, Elliot. Uh, and yes. together you explore the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cousin. Cousin Elliot. <laughs> so uh, the, the two of you, um, you know, you explore, uh, you know, the world of superhero news, uh, uh, movies, you do uh, really cool character analysis. And nowadays, you know, being a comic book nerd has, you know, really, it's never really been better. And, you know, there's just so many new movies and video games and comic books coming out. And especially the stories related to uh, black characters have been uh, such a drastic improvement, especially in the last years. We've seen, you know, really good examples of, you know, like Miles Morales, of Black Lightning, Luke Cage, Black Panther, you know, Suicide Squad, Justice League, Watchmen. So there's all these different like new, uh, this new generation of representation for black superheroes. Um, and so for our last question of the day, uh, I want to know, uh, what you want to see within this next generation of black superhero representation like what what characters or topics within the black superhero genre do you want to explore um you know it i i know that um you know this modern generation uh, is coming up so are there any tv shows or or movies that you'd like to see the most yes um i would love to see a few different things so like I would love to, so I love, yeah, I love superheroes. Um, like you had said, my cousin and I, we have the comic book queens. And so we have this running joke um, that we are like our two favorite like Marvel heroes. So his favorite Marvel hero is, um, is Storm and then mine's is Phoenix, right? or Jean Grey slash Marvel girl. And so, um, the thing that I would love to see is more Black superheroes, right? So, like, not just, like, Storm. Because, like, Storm is, like, I feel like the most recognizable slash, like, most iconic, like, Black superhero, like, of all time, yeah. right? Like, yeah. She, like, everyone knows who Storm is, right? And um, that's great. And I love Storm. And I think that she is a... Um, I think that she's a wonderful character. I think that there is, um, she's like, I think that she embodies so many different things that are really, I think, important. I'm um, like for, for black, for black women, I think specifically, right. Um, 
not only is Storm this powerful goddess, but she is also wise and she is also, she's also like very soft, which, but I think a lot of people don't get to, if they're not super familiar with the character, they don't know, like Storm is like very empathetic and she is like a very good friend and she loves gardening, right? Like these things that are like very soft about her um, that also humanize her in a way that I think Black women are often robbed of, right? Like the Black women are not allowed to be multidimensional. And I feel like Storm is a very multidimensional um, Black character. So one of the things that I, my, my curiosity about Storm has always been though, and actually the thing that I always think about that's always, that feels lacking from superhero from the superhero genre, or like at least from the main blockbuster big superhero genre. So thinking about Marvel and DC, which have like the longest tentacles of reach, is race never actually is a factor of people's characters, right? Of any of the black characters that we have. So with with I think with the exception of like, um, or let me rephrase that. Because I'm now I'm thinking of uh, examples that are like so race when it comes to blackness I feel like the blackness that's represented is oftentimes one dimensional it is very like leans more to the conservative side and is still very like palatable for like white supremacy right the only I feel like radical representation of blackness is Black Panther but then um. But the conflict of like even that movie and even, and I'm not familiar with like, I'm not like a comic book reader, but I love comic book characters. So I've watched like every animated like cartoon series. I've seen it more than once, right? Um, and so from what I understand, like um, T'Challa as like a character archetype is there's still, he's like, he's still heterosexual. There's still like Wakanda very much still mirrors what would the world look like if black people could participate in like white supremacist structures, right? Like of like monarchs and things like that. I um, mean, he doesn't explore, he doesn't talk about blackness in relationship to like his teammates when he was like on the Avengers or like, it was like very like, oh, y'all do this stuff, right? But it wasn't, I was like, that's still not going deep enough. Because I'm like, the T'Challa didn't have to interact with his Blackness in the same way that, like, let's say Luke Cage would have to, because he existed in a bubble where Blackness was, like, affirmed. Um, and then, like, character archetypes like Luke Cage are oftentimes, like, and I don't want to say one-dimensional because, like, there are people who are inner city and who grew up in rough neighborhoods and, like, they also need to see themselves represented. But I feel like there was a time when, like, Black superhero hero characters were being made where they were just like, this is what all Black people are. All Black people, like, grew up in the hood. And I'm just like, no, some of us grew up in the suburbs. Um, and so, like, so what I would love to see, or I think, and I'm thinking about like um, Black Green Lantern, who is the only Green Lantern that I know. I don't know any of the other ones. I don't know them. Um, how he was like a Marine. And I was just like, ugh, I hate <laughs> that. Hero. I was just like, ugh. Cause that's what the, like, those are the types of things that will happen, right? Is they'll take Black characters and they'll make them Marines. They'll, so then like, and they'll make them have like conservative leaning points. They'll make them monarchs or they'll make them like these like people who grew up in the inner city. So I'm just like, what about people like, I'm like, what about a Black queer fan who grew up in the suburbs and like, And as a feminist and is like constantly talking and it's and it like, and where my race and my gender and uh, my queerness are being brought up into conversations about the types of things that we're fighting for, right? Because one of the things I think about with Storm is I always am just like, in X-Men, does race just not exist anymore? Because I'm like, is Storm, is I'm like, has being a mutant just like taken over and everyone's just like, are you a mutant or are you not a mutant? Cause I'm like, Storm is still black. <laughs> so I'm just like, I feel like somebody on submission, if racism still exists, probably was like, I don't want this N word saving me, right? And there is never this like complication of Storm being like, 
I don't want to save any of these people because they're fucking racist. And on top of them being racist to me as a black person, they also are like supremacists are like human supremacists too, because they're just like mutants are bad. So I would really love to see superhero genres actually deal with race and not use the mutation, use, other things as stand-ins because I'm like, they're not, it's not the same. And I think that it's actually, I actually feel like constantly using one thing as an analogy, it flattens the real lived experiences of people when you have multiples of that identity, right? Because then it allows for, and like there, I think that it does something to people's psyche when they're just like, oh, everyone can be oppressed and everyone is in a white body. <laughs> because then you're just like, oh, white people face oppression too. I'm just like, yes, but you don't face racism. So like, this can't be a stand-in for racism when you're not facing it. We also still need to like unpack what does it mean to be a superhero on this part of the super elite whatever, and then people are calling you the N word still. And and I like what you said about the um the term flattening because that really um that really is a great way of describing what what happens um because i mean especially it's it's tough because like um, especially when it comes to marvel i mean marvel is owned by disney and we all know that as a corporation disney isn't you know all it's chalked up to be it's not it's not just the happy nostalgic thing like the actually as an organization you know they've been undercutting a lot of people they have been underpaying a lot of people there's been a lot of shady shit going on within the organization and a lot of people have also talked about how you know marvel movies um really is just like american war exceptionalism rebranded in a superhero skin um and 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 so sometimes it's it's like it can be difficult as a progressive person where you're like, cool, I like the representation, but like, but the themes that are going on of like soft colonization and oh, military force, like these concepts are still being normalized. And like you said, like, and, and I didn't even really, you know, make that leap to, to really think about it that way, but you're absolutely right in that so much of it is done in this more conservative lens where it's like, you know, we're give you, we're going to give you the representation, but we're going to do it on our terms. And yes. I think that's one of the, the I, I think that that really is the solution for what this next generation of representation for, uh, for all communities of color should be, you know, because especially since the new Shang-Chi movie came out, I haven't seen it yet, but I know that a lot of people liked it. But just overall in this conversation of representation, and this is something that I always repeat on the podcast, which is, it's not just enough to be represented. It's about the quality of the representation. And it's about who who we're representing, what ideas from that community we are representing. Because it's not as if like, okay, there's, you know, com- representation for black communities. Boom. That is just the representation that you need. Because you know, yes. there's like a million different fragmented little micro communities within the black community. And just like you yeah. said, there's just so many identities. It doesn't have to always be the 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 superhero buff person. It doesn't always have to be the, the cis straight military, you know, straight lace kind of person. Um, exactly. And there's just, I think oh, it's like, there is, so another example that came up when you were talking that I think that my, that my cousin and I were like, we, so we were watching, um, One of the events, so there's three different Avengers animated series. There's like the OG one from the 90s. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that one's like, I don't remember what it's it's like. And all of them have, like, they're all, none of them are just called the Avengers. They're like the Avengers, blah, 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 something. Mm -hmm. So we're, so I've been watching all three of them, but I can't, so there's, it's not Earth's Mightiest Hero. It's, and it's not the OG one. It's the other, other one. So we were watching it. And on this like iteration, Falcon is part of the team. The, um, and so there was an episode where Falcon was upset because people couldn't remember who he was. 
And so they were like, they, you know, they, the, the episode begins with them saving the city or whatever. And people were like, oh, thank you, Captain America. Thank you, Hawkeye. Thank you, Hulk. Thank you, Iron Man. Thank you, Thor. And then they were like, who are you? And so he his like, and the thing was, it's like, oh, well, he hadn't been a part of the team for a long time. But I'm like, he's the only fucking black person on the fucking team. How do you not remember who he is? He's literally the only <laughs> one. And so Captain America was like, don't take it personally. Like being a superhero, like that's not what being a superhero is about. It's not, it's not about like people remembering who you are. And my cousin and I were just like, mm -mm, no, this, this doesn't fit right with our spirit. Like we, no, we were like, fuck that. And I was like, this is actually really harmful because there are a lot of things that are happening. And like in this very small moment, there were so many harmful things that happened, right? So one of them is like, to me, as a black person, I'm just like, I'm watching this and this is how we do this weird thing where we're like, we're gonna give you representation, but we're also still gonna send you fucked up messaging about race, right? So like, them using, they made like, there was a choice made to use the black character to be the one that is ignored. Then there was another choice made to minimize the fact that people can't remember who he is, even though he is the only black hero on the team of white people. There was another choice made for Captain America to fucking gaslight him and be like, it's not that big of a deal. Of course it's not a big deal to you because everyone knows who the fuck you are. It is a big deal to me, right? And I was like, this could have actually been a really great episode to explore why Falcon was actually upset. It could, this could, I was like, this could have gone a completely different way. And this could have been a teachable moment for the Avengers and the people who are watching to understand what does it feel like to be othered and then for people to try to ignore the fact that you were othered but then having other people constantly other you right because not remembering who the only black avengers member is there's a reason why you can't remember who he is it's not because he's not impressive it's because you don't care about what black people do right mm -hmm. so i was just like now we're sending people messages that like racial violence actually isn't that big of a deal and it's totally fine when your white co-workers gaslight you and tell you that racism isn't that big of a deal and you just need to get over it because being a superhero is more important and and, and that you know totally reminds me of again that that comment that you were talking about you know that was that was very chilling and 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 this idea of you know what you're doing. You acknowledge that you are doing it. You know that there is a strategy and there is a tactic behind this. And part of the strategy is racist in motivation, but you still continue to do it. Yeah. Wow. Well, Karen, I, I have learned so much from our discussion. Um, I, I wish that we had more time to nerd out about superhero stuff. Uh, Carlin, it's uh, been awesome having you on the show. Uh, before we say goodbye to our audience, uh, what are you working on and where can the Black community find and support you? Yes, um, I'm working on a few different things. So I am working on like formally launching uh, my business, which we had mentioned is the High Priestess Consulting Company. So if you loved this conversation and you want to hire me for a training, you can send me an email um, so we can do that. Uh, my email for that is kbradley1224 at gmail.com. I also am recording my podcast, Beneath the Surface. I would love for folks to listen to some of my other episodes um, there. You can find that podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Anchor, and some other streaming services that I don't know that people use, but they're there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you can also follow Beneath the Surface on Facebook at Beneath the Surface. Um, and then you can follow that on Twitter and Instagram at BT Surface Pod. And then if you want to follow me, um, you can follow me on my Facebook, which is my name, Carlin Bradley. Um, you can follow me on Instagram, um, which is k.d.bradley. And you can see my beautiful photos of me being a bad bitch and an amateur model and the delicious food that I cook. So, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> awesome. Well, Colin, we'll go ahead and link uh, to all of your websites. Again, it's been a pleasure having you on. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.